back with you on a Friday for a special rising exclusive interview with 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He joins us now. Welcome to Rising. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we so appreciate it. Uh, so many questions we want to get to. So let's kick it right off uh, with COVID. So friends of our show, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, reported the other day that the earliest COVID patients actually did come from the Wuhan lab. They were scientists there. If this is confirmed, it would all but guarantee the lab leak theory, which I believe you've said in the past, you also think uh, COVID originated from a Chinese lab. If that is the case, I want to know, will you prosecute Fauci and hold others criminally responsible in the U.S. health apparatus who advocated and funded gain-of-function research? Uh, I think I'm going to have to look at that, but I think they should be prosecuted. I think um, it was you know, reckless endangerment. Uh, they knew, you know, these all of these labs, including the Wuhan lab, had a history of leaks. Uh, there were numerous memos from the State Department and others saying that the lab was dangerous. It wasn't even a BSL-4 lab that they were doing these this research in. It was a BSL-2, BSL-3 labs that have, uh, you know, have very, very low thresholds and have, have uh, and this kind of research is malpractice to do it in the labs that the, the actual scientists who got ill, who they're now saying is patient one, is Ben Hu, who was the underling for the bat lady for Xi Zheng Li, and his funding and her funding came directly from NIH, and NIH taught them the technology for developing, not only for, uh, for making the technology that was used to make these viruses more infectious, uh, more virulent, more deadly, but also the, this technology called the seamless ligation technique, which is just a bioweapons technique for concealing human tampering on engineered viruses. And uh, it was utterly irresponsible to be teaching anybody that. They should not have developed that technique in the first place. It's the inverse of everything that mm. you would do if you actually were interested in public health. Mm. It's just um, it's bioweapons technology. So sticking with COVID just for one more minute here, uh, President Biden obviously mandated vaccines for millions of workers before the Supreme Court struck that down. President Trump presided over Operation Warp Speed uh, to have government funding to get the vaccines off the ground. How would your administration have handled vaccines differently in terms of mandates and government funding for them. What did those two individuals do that you would have done differently? They did almost everything wrong. They, you know, first of all, they shouldn't have locked down society. We now know, and we knew back then, that it would be cataclysmic, that it would cause far more injury and economic costs, long-term economic costs, $16 trillion it's going to cost our country over the long run. It shifted four trillion dollars in wealth from the middle class in our country to this new, you know, uh, uh, oligarchy of billionaires. We created a billionaire a day during the pandemic. All of the pandemic response preparedness protocols that have been developed for decades, in fact, almost for a century, all said unanimously, you do not lock down societies, you keep them open. You quarantine the sick, you protect the vulnerable, you keep society open, and then you focus on therapeutic drugs, drugs with proven safety histories. And that's what we should have done. It would have been much more effective to give people even vitamin D and to lock them down and wait for a vaccine that we now know. You know, the Cleveland Clinic study just came out, a new version of the study yesterday that shows that the more vaccines that you got, the more likely you are to get COVID. This is what the science is saying. That's 56,000 employees of Cleveland Clinic, a, you know, a, a, a major large study is showing the vaccine not only doesn't work, but it works opposite of what we were told that it was going to work. We should have focused on the, the therapeutic remedies that actually work. It's things like Zithromax, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, uh, the countries that use those had much better records. We, our protocol gave us the worst body count from COVID on earth. So doing everything that our government told us to do, we racked up 16% of the COVID deaths globally. We only have 4.2% of the population. 
The countries that used ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, countries like Nigeria didn't even have a pandemic. We were told they were going to suffer terribly because of their poverty. Instead, they had a death rate one two hundredth of the death rate we had in this country. And you can look across the globe. The countries that adopted our protocols did the worst in terms of COVID deaths, COVID mortalities. The countries that did the opposite, that employed ivermectin, employed hydroxychloroquine. Nigeria had a 1.3% vaccination rate, mm. and it had 14 deaths per million population. We had 3,000 deaths per million population. Of course, it was a war on the poor. The poor suffered and shouldered the burden of, of mm. these protocols more than any other parts of our population. Well, to, well that's a good segue to our next question. Go well, ahead, Brianna. Well, to, to your point, actually, about uh, the aggregation of wealth that happened during the pandemic and how it disproportionately, uh, the, the economic burden was on the poor, and 60, uh, the billionaires, millionaires and billionaires' uh, wealth increased by 64 percent in the context of the pandemic. And so I want to put to you, uh, a majority of Americans support a wealth tax for that reasons and others. You've described how much better the economic system was, the, cultural, the culture of your youth was in the, the period between the war and the 1980s. Uh, would you support the kind of taxation that also existed back then when there were uh, more taxes levied on the very wealthy? My plan, Brianna, is not to change the overall tax burden. I'll, I will shift the burden around. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that. Uh, I know that I will restore the, uh, the child tax credits. And, uh, and so the burden will shift, but I'm not going to raise the overall burden on taxes for Americans. So Biden committed to not raising taxes on uh, people who made less than $400,000 a year. Are you saying that you wouldn't raise taxes on anyone, including those uh, like the billionaire tax, which is extremely popular, and others who make well over $400,000 a year? I'm not saying that I won't shift the tax burden. I'm saying that I'm not going to tax people more who I'm not going to raise taxes on people who make less than $400,000 a year. As I said, I may shift the overall tax burden. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that yet. I need to study that issue, and I need to sit down with experts and figure out the best way for achieving, for keeping our economy moving and re actually rebooting our economy. And But also, ultimately, I think what you talked about at the beginning, which was to figure out ways to restore the middle class in this country and reduce these extreme dis disparities between very wealthy, the uh, very wealthy, these huge aggregations of wealth and the widespread poverty that we're seeing below. We need to do that. It's not healthy for our society. It is an unstable configuration that cannot support democracy for any kind of sustained periods. One of the reasons I think you're completely right that critics of extreme wealth think that there are anti-democratic implications are because the very, very wealthy have tried to do things like buy their way into elections the way that uh, Bloomberg did in the last cycle. There's obviously an incredibly corruptive influence from lobbying, money, and politics, things that you've criticized a great deal in the context of the CDC and the pharmaceutical industry. And so I'm curious how you plan to run your own campaign. Do you have any plans to take a no, co no corporate money pledge the way that uh, Bernie Sanders did in 2020 and still managed to outfundraise the rest of the field? And if not, how do you plan to manage some of the conflicts of interest that emerge when people, let's say some of the Silicon Valley billionaires who have shown interest in your campaign, start to make demands potentially uh, that are out of step with what the American public would like? Uh, I am going to, I mean, our, you know, there's there, there are limits on what I can accept, you know, the, the campaign can only accept contributions of $3,300 per, per person. That's the maximum campaign contribution. Uh, most of our contributions so far have been much smaller than that. Uh, and, you know, and, I, and we are not legally allowed to accept campaign contributions that are larger than that. Of course, there are these other ways that people contribute, right? They host fundraisers for folks. They're independent expenditures. They're not supposed to be directed by campaigns, but campaigns have found ways of getting around that. I'm not saying you specifically, obviously, but there are ways that campaigns signal how they would like money to be spent. And with 
Citizens United, there's almost an unlimited ability for corporations to spend uh, to support their own political causes. Is that a concern for you? Do you have any plans to address Citizens United? Do you have any plans to do campaign finance reform? I don't think there's anything that's probably more important for our democracy than figuring out a way to reverse Citizens United from a pragmatic standpoint, because the Supreme Court has upheld that and has, I think, very, very wrongly equated campaign contributions with free speech and essentially given them First Amendment protections. I think that was a very bad decision. I think it's been a catastrophe for our country. Uh, I am open to suggestions about how to reverse Citizens United. It's, it's something that I've been thinking about since 2000, I think 2008, when it was, uh, when that decision came down. You know, we almost lost democracy. We did lose democracy in the, this country and during the Gilded Age in the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, where you had our, our country senators at that point were not directly elected, they were chosen by the legislatures. The big trust, the steel trust, the oil trust, the railroad trust, the sugar trust owned those legislatures. It was literally, literally said of the Pennsylvania state legislature that nobody was for sale because John D. Rockefeller already owned them all and he would not part with them. And that was the way it was for legislatures all over the country. And so those wealthy individuals were choosing the United States senators. They controlled the political parties. They chose the, the president. And um, we were able to rescue democracy. And in 1908, we passed a law. One of the things we did, we passed antitrust law laws, we passed child labor laws. We gave women the vote. Uh, but the, probably the most important law that we passed to restore democracy was a law that we passed in 2008 that made it illegal, or 1908, that made it illegal for large corporations to contribute to federal political campaigns. And that law has stayed in place for 100 years and protected American democracy. The United States Supreme Court threw out that law in 2008 and unleashed the tsunami of corporate money. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not allowed to coordinate with our super PACs. Um, but uh, it's, I think, you know, and Bernie was able to do, as you said, to raise a lot of money. And I think Obama was raised a lot of money. And that's what I'm going to focus on from small donors. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're a super PAC, I, you know, it, it, the law is just wrong in our country, but it's hard to, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we, you, at, at some point, you have to say, okay, I'm going to play by the rules as they are given to us. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to bring a knife to a gunfight. Mm. And um, and uh, so I don't know what they're going to do, but I can see the logic of, of, uh, of taking money from larger donors if you're, you know, if you're supporting somebody that's going to try to reform the system. I want to ask you about the culture, uh, social issues. You are someone who's getting some support from, I think, Republicans or former Republicans, uh, maybe because of your stances on uh, vaccines, aspects of COVID. Um, conservative voters right now, a lot of them on the right are animated by culture war issues. These questions about gender identity in school, in sports, it's, it kind of goes under the category of wokeness. I wonder, because uh, I'm not sure I've heard you um, talk about this as much or answer questions about it. Do you, what are your views on wokeness? Do you have a definition of, wo of wokeness? Do you have views on uh, transgender individuals participating in sports, um, the, the, what's being taught in schools? You know, what is your view on this package of woke issues that so animates uh, the, the right, which are some of your supporters? I have said this in the past, I'm opposed to um, to uh, uh, transgender people, to, to people who were born as biological males, participating in competitive female sports. If, they, if sports, uh, and I'll tell you why, my uncle was the author of Title IX, and he spent years and years allied with, with women's groups who were, being, uh, who were being treated like uh, redheaded stepchildren when it came to by colleges and everybody else when it came to sport, to organized sports. My uncle fought for, wrote, and passed Title IX. And it finally gave women the ability 
to participate in sports. And it doesn't make any sense to me that somebody who is, has the advantages, the physical advantage of being born a, a, a biological male in muscle mass, in height, in size, in strength, and coordination should be able to walk off a playing field playing men's sports and, and then walk onto a playing field playing women's sports. And that, I want to start by saying this, though. Anybody who makes that choice to be transgender, gender, should not be shamed, they should not be embarrassed, they should be proud of, of their choices, and they should be respected, those choices should be respected, we should all do that. But there's, there's, that, that is a boundary that just doesn't make any sense for anybody to, you know, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I have a niece who is playing softball for Boston College right now, and she has devoted tens of thousands of hours in her life practicing that sport with the hope of getting that scholarship. And everybody on her team is in the same way, and it doesn't seem to me fair as somebody who has these profound biological advantages should be able to walk on that team and take one of those places from one of those girls. It just doesn't make any sense. And Mr. Kennedy, there, there's a recent study that shows that a lot of Americans are increasingly divided on that particular issue. But given the very small number of trans kids there actually are, or trans people generally speaking, that are seeking participation in sports, some members of the trans community are frustrated that there hasn't been more attention to the literally hundreds of pieces of legislation that have been coming down the transom just since the beginning of this year that, that would do things like restrict people's ability to dress as the gender that wasn't assigned as birth in public. There have been drag performances, performances of classic Shakespeare plays that have been implicated in some of this legislation, legislation that uh, impedes on a parent's uh, and family's ability to make decisions about the health of their children in consultation with a doctor. And I wonder what you say to the Re Republican Party, who are largely pushing legislation, is, is, are pushing pieces of legislation like this down the pike. Uh, I would say what I said a moment ago is that I believe that people should be respected in their choices and that, you know, they should be supported in those choices and that, um, you know, about their their gender choices. Oh, so I, I don't, you know, any legislation that is mean spirited or that is going to, you know, that is disrespectful to people or is bullying, I don't, you know, I'm not going to be for that. Well, I want to ask you, uh, changing gears a little bit, about Donald Trump. Obviously, he was just indicted under the Espionage Act. Now, you have been very vocal about your support for Julian Assange, saying on day one uh, you would like to pardon him. He was also obviously charged under the Espionage Act. And many conservatives right now are looking to the fact that Mike Pence, uh, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton have also had these document retention cases, uh, all of whom have not been prosecuted. We don't know yet what's going to happen in the Joe Biden case, of course. But they contrast that with how certain whistleblowers like Julian Assange, reality winner, et cetera, have been treated, even when they, too, had no— um, uh, there was no proof that they were attempting to do actual espionage, give the documents to a foreign poly, uh, po a party. In one instance, a 66-year-old Vietnamese-American civil servant was jailed for five and a half years for taking documents home just to work on them over the weekend to get ahead. So what do you say to conservatives who say what's happening to Trump is, in fact, a political prosecution if people who have, are similarly um, implicated in what he's been charged with or who have done less have gone to jail, but Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, um, and uh, uh, Joe Biden himself are not being charged? Well, first of all, I don't like the Espionage Act, and I think it should be repealed. Um, I think, you know, I I thought the, the Brianna, I thought the New York prosecutor, I, I also want to say this, I don't know that much about I have not studied the case against Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, I'm speaking kind of off the top of my head. I looked at uh, a kind of casually or cursorily the case, the New York case um, that, uh, you know, that the New York prosecutor Eric Adams brought. And I thought that that case was weak. And I, I, if I had been a prosecutor, I was once a prosecutor, I would not have brought that case. And I think you can make a case for it, but um, I think when it comes to prosecuting a 
political figure, particularly a president of the United States, the prosecutors have to walk a really thin line and a very, very delicate line because we, our country has always tried to avoid the optics and the reality of politically based, uh, politically grounded prosecutions. It's something that's done in totalitarian countries. It was something that was done in Great Britain uh, prior to the American Revolution and that the framers of our constitution were warned against. So people are being, they, they're two kind of countervailing for, um, ID principles. One is that people who are in political power should not be above the law. If they break the law, they should pay for it like other people. But there's another countervailing uh, principle, which is in democracies, it's dangerous to start prosecuting people criminally uh, and unless there is a really compelling reason to do so because it, it, it gives rise to accusation and the optics that it's a politically based prosecution. So I think prosecutors have to be careful about that. I thought the New York um, prosecution did not, in my view, and again, you know, the prosecutor may know more about it than I do, so I don't want to second guess him. But in my view, it didn't pass the threshold that you, you know, that I would want to see for a prosecution of the of the president of the United States. Um, the I don't know enough about this case. I mean, I've heard things about it. I think that the danger to President Trump of this case is that the judge made this extraordinary decision to penetrate the attorney-client privilege, which is almost never done, but it is done in cases where the attorneys uh, appear to be in collusion to commit a crime. Right. And that is, you know, and that is, um, you know, I guess was the rationale in this case. And I think once that decision was made that the case against President Trump is very, very strong, yeah, just if you quickly, ask um, whether I like the Espionage Act, I think the Espionage Act has been an anti-democratic act from its inception. It has always been in disrepute, particularly among liberals. Liberals have always hated that act, and it has been used to silence people who should have had the right to free speech throughout American history. It has been misused and abused by people in political power throughout our history. And, you know, if it was my choice, I would repeal it. Well, just quickly on that, Tucker Carlson, in the latest episode of his new Twitter program, made the argument that the reason that Trump is being prosecuted under the Espionage Act, while others haven't been, is because of the statements that he made in the context of his 2016 campaign and after that were targeting the blob and the fact that he's positioned himself whether authentically or just rhetorically, as an anti-war candidate. You have spoken about the consequences of doing so, again, talking about the fact that you think that uh, your uncle was killed in part because of his anti-war stance. And I wonder what you make of this argument. Do you think that uh, Trump's politics and his dissonance with the intelligence community and the military-industrial complex are part of what's fueling the prosecution of him under the Espionage Act? I would have no idea about that. I mean, how would I know that? I mean, nothing those guys do, you can't see, it's all obscure. So I would have no way of knowing, or I would never speculate about something about which I just, I have no way of knowing what motivated the, you know, the, this prosecution. I mean, listen, I don't look, I never, I try never to look at people's motives because you, know, you never can understand them. I wrote this whole book on Anthony Fauci and Bill Gates. And never in that book do I look into their heads and say, this is why they were doing that action. All I can say is this is the actions they took. These actions appear wrong on their face, but I can't really speculate as to why they took them. And I'm not going to speculate about this. Hmm. The DNC uh, has stated it won't actually hold a Democratic primary debate. I wonder what you make of how you know, you're being treated by the DNC, given your your fairly significant minority, but significant poll numbers. And if, for instance, we held a debate here at Rising at the Hill with you, Marianne Williamson, and we would, of course, invite President Biden, would you participate in that? Well, I would love to participate in a debate if President Biden participates in a debate. I think it's wrong. You know, I think it's wrong that he's not going to participate. And the reason I think it's wrong, of course, he has that power to not do it. And it's a strategic choice for him. And I think if I were in his shoes, I wouldn't want to debate um, either. 
but I think it's bad for America at this point. I think if if he doesn't feel that it, he can debate, it's not it's not good because you know there's so many people in this country who feel that the system is rigged, and that particularly the political system and the electoral system is rigged, and that are you know it's the political parties like the Soviet Union that are picking the candidates, and the public has nothing to do with them and. I think it's really important for both political parties to make themselves at this point role models, templates for democracy, not only for this country, but, you know, to show around the world that we actually have a real democracy where politicians are out doing retail politics, going to town halls that are not just, you know, fixed with it, where you know what the questions are going to be, you know who the people are, they're screened but are actually going into barbershops and nail salons and diners and gas stations and talking to the public. There's a huge number of people in this country who feel that they've been forgotten. You know, 57% of Americans who couldn't put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency right now, and they feel like there's nobody in the political system that's listening to them. And they're right. The political the politicians now... They, because of Citizens United, they're, they're, they, it's very easy for a politician to go to the billionaires, raise a billion dollars, and then fly over the country at 30,000 feet and aerial bombard the country with advertisements and then drop in occasionally for these phony rallies that are just kabuki theater where they know everybody who went into that rally. They know the questions they're going to ask. And, and, you know, there's a lot of flag waving and, and clap, clapping. It's not politics. It's fake politics. And I think it's really, and people know that. Americans feel that they're not being listened to, that the system is broken. Even on you know, January 6th, as bad as that was, you have to understand that there, it, it was motivated by people who think the system is rigged. And one of our responses to that, other than prosecuting the people who broke the law, should also be, okay, it's time to fix the system. Let's not, let's not. You know, let's not let's not allow people to continue to believe that the whole thing is rigged against them and that, you know, everything is fixed and that the political parties get to choose who's going to run. And anybody who tries to enter the process is fenced out. So I don't think that's healthy. Well, you made it just quickly. You, you made a really excellent point about how few Americans can access cash right now. Uh, the stat we used to say during the Bernie campaign was that 40 percent of Americans can come up with $400 for an emergency. Right now, in the fall, Biden made a, a, a deal with Republicans to end the student loan moratorium that Trump implemented during uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so people are going to be asked to pay a lot more uh, than a few hundred dollars uh, Four, five hundred, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars when their student loan payments kick in uh, again in the fall. Do you see any daylight between how you would handle the student debt crisis and what Joe Biden had, had done? And what do you make of the choice to end the student loan moratorium? I mean, I think we've got to we, we've got to give uh, uh, some kind of massive debt forgiveness to this generation of kids if we want to unleash their creative energies and rebuild our country. You know, it costs now, I paid, when I went to the University of Virginia Law School, I paid $600 per semester. And, uh, you know, and that was, that's low, but, but um, on average, the cost of education since 1970 has multiplied by seven times. And, mm -hmm. they, you know, my wife, uh, it took her till she was, who's a you know well-known actress, and uh, it took her till she was thirty-seven years old to pay back her student loan, and that's Relatable. like an anchor. <laughs> you know, it, it, it uh, it's an anchor on on creative activity and entrepreneurial activity and the kind of you know um and, and the kind of energies that we want to release in our our children. To, so to so that to that point specifically. Innovation. Mr. Kennedy, the, the, when you're talking about barriers on creativity and entrepreneurship, et cetera, health care is repeatedly raised by people, small business owners, et cetera, as one of the largest costs they have when they start a new business. And of course, Medicare for All was such an animating force of the last two Bernie campaigns and really galvanized a lot of previous non-voters uh, and disgruntled Democrats into a movement. You said in a recent interview that you were for Medicare for All in theory, but that you found it, um, I, 
believe you were something along the lines of uh, politically uh, unlikely, some, something to that effect. I don't mean to put words in your mouth. But it strikes me that some of the other things that you've been fighting for, I think, really valiantly, like cutting the military budget, taking on the military industrial complex, are also things which will face intense pushback um, from the blob, from these deeply entrenched, very well-funded industries. Um, and, and that being said, given the obstacles to fighting the military-industrial complex, what do you say to progressives who are disappointed that you don't seem to have that same uh, urgency with respect to health care, which is repeatedly ranked as such a significant concern for Americans, and Medicare for All in particular, which 88 percent of Democratic voters support? Yeah, well, let me answer both, uh, all of your questions. You know, one is, just from a practical standpoint, Brianna, the, the, uh, in terms of cutting the military budget, um, it's easier for a president to do than passing a national health care program. And, and a lot of those costs that, you know, the president can do on his own without that much cooperation from Congress. Um, so... Uh, it, it, and that's why I think it's like, it's a of course you're you're challenging vested interests that are as powerful as the pharmaceutical industry and the you know the medical cartels, but it's an easier thing. The the president does not need to get you know uh, 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 fifty one senators and uh, two hundred and fifty congressmen on board. Um, so. And then, you know, with Medicare, look, I watched my uncle and fought with him for 50 years trying to get national health care through. And so, and I, you know, I'm very conscious of, of the deadlock that he reached. And I am, you know, if, if it were up to me, I would say we should have Medicare for all, all right now. The, the current way of, fund, of funding Medicare is not worth of funding health care in our country is dysfunctional. Um, I what I would advocate is a for is a public option option which goes which will lead ultimately into Medicare for all if it but but give people individual choice. I'm somebody who is for personal freedom for personal choice, and I think the public option is more consistent with that belief. And if we can make a public option, a public option that, for example. Uh, would charge a maximum of 8% of, of people's income rather than the 20% that they're paying today. If we can make that option work, and if we can make it attractive to Americans, you will naturally evolve it into Medicare for all. But you will do it through a process of choice and evolution rather than, uh, than imposing it on people with a lot of hostility, which is just practically impossible to do as you probably understand and I understand because I was involved in the healthcare battle for, for so so long. Well can you can you speak specifically problem. to what no, you I, think, I the, think the yeah I'm I sorry. Think we need to think of it. I think we think need to think because we have to acknowledge these deadlocks, acknowledge these practical obstacles, and we have to think in terms of ways to unify Americans in in ways that will reduce the overall cost of health care. The healthcare costs now in this country are 4.3 trillion. That, that is far higher per capita than any other country on earth. We pay much more than anybody, double or triple what people pay per capita in Europe or Canada. And our healthcare outcomes are 79th in the world. We're behind Mongolia, we're behind Cuba, we're behind Costa Rica and healthcare outcomes. And one of the problems, one of the reasons for that, probably the principal reason, in fact, the principal reason is, is chronic disease epidemic. We have the highest burden of chronic disease of any nation in the world. Why is that? Why can't we eliminate it? We know that it comes from environmental exposures. Why aren't we doing the science to identify what those exposures are and to eliminate them? That will eliminate a, a huge chunk of our healthcare costs and give us a lot more elasticity and flexibility in the way that we allocate those costs to, you know, to uh, different actors within the system, which is really what you're doing when you switch from HMOs to, you know, to Medicare for all. Yeah, Mr. Kennedy, I do think, I do just want to push back and say that I think, for one, the continued presence of a private healthcare system 
undermines some of the savings that come through a Medicare for All style system by letting people opt out in a way that diminishes the pool that the costs are spread over. So that's that's one concern people have with that. But more specifically, you're, you're such a vocal and persuasive critic of industry capture and the ways uh, and the and the kinds of corruption that caused there to be such a disconnect between that what the average American wants, 88% of Democrats and a majority, a slim majority, but a majority of Republicans all support Medicare for all. So when you look at Congress and say, well, Congress won't pass it, even though the constituents in those congressional di districts want it. I think that what people are looking for is a, a leader, a president, who exposes the extent to which elected representatives are not, in fact, representing the interests of their people, and that they feel pressure, therefore, to start to do that. And when they hear a, future, a presidential candidate saying, well, you know, there are these obstacles, and so we're going to take another track, it makes some people ask, well, when are we ever going to get that Medicare for all? When are we, how many, yes, we have chronic disease, we have these other issues, but how long are people supposed to subsist and suffer and have medical debt and die? While we know overwhelming majorities of Americans all want one solution, and it is elected representatives, including many of those in the Democratic Party, that are standing in the way. You know, Brianna, I agree with virtually everything that you say. Um, the, the, you know, the issue is that I've been, you know, I've been in the in the trenches for fifty years fighting on this issue, and it's an issue that is because of the, you know, because of what we're dealing with in Congress and elsewhere, it's, 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 it's entrenched, it's a source of polarization, and I just, I feel like I need to uh, look at ways of solving this that are actually practical. So I would like to get to the same place you are, which is Medicare for all, but I, you know, I think the, the, the path to doing that and, and if you remember, Brianna, when Obamacare got passed, there was a uh, there, there were a lot of problems with it. There were a lot of glitches with it and that made people very, very angry about it for the first two or three years. And then those glitches were slowly worked out. And the option that I'm proposing, which is to begin with the public option, will allow the glitches to be worked out in advance so that ultimately when and if we get to medicare for all we won't have those uh those times where people really get harmed by by the implementation of a new system mm. so you know that's i i would say that's my best answer to you i want mm. the same thing that you want i believe most americans that want want it i think you know listen my my uncle you know, I, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I was um, in Senate caucus meetings with him in his office talking to people campaigning across the country, pointing out that this was the only country in the world, where the only industrialized country in the world where people can work their entire lives and have their savings wiped out by a single illness, catastrophic illness. This is the only country in the world, industrialized country, where parents can sit in a living room and listen to their baby crying in the room next door and have to wonder whether that baby is $50 sick or $100 sick, $500 sick before they bring him to a hospital and then have to make really difficult choices. And it's unfair. It's wrong. We should have, we should have Medicare for all in this country. The, the you know, the obstacle that I just recognize is somebody who is trying to deal with issues pr pr pragmatically is that it is, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a, to put it mildly, a heavy lift. Hmm. Want to be respectful of your time, of course, so this will be the last question, but just before you go, on the show we've been discussing increased interest in aliens, UFOs. Congress recently uh, held historic hearings on Capitol Hill on the matter. Uh, whistleblower David Grush has claimed that these hearings fell short of sharing all the government knows with the American people going so far as to claim the government is in possession of actually non-human craft. So we'd love to know your thoughts on this. If you think there's UFO intelligence that should be declassified, um, you know, rather than having this guarded closely, whatever it is, by military and U.S. intelligence agencies. All I can say is if they got it, it's one of the first questions I'm going to ask, and I'm going to want to see the little fellas and their and their spacecraft, and I will, uh, and then disclose everything that I can. I'll disclose everything to the American public unless there's some really compelling reason 
a nod to, which I, you know, I don't, I, I don't anticipate, but I, I mean, I'm, I, I read the article by that guy, you know, about that whistleblower who's still in the military, and it just seemed very credible to me. But I don't know; I don't have any way of assessing it. And I guess they're taking it seriously on Capitol Hill, which I'm, I'm very happy about. I mean, I, I think everybody's curious about this. Everybody would love to know whether we're, we have, you know, whether we have company neighbors in the universe. It's really exciting, and I think, uh, I mean, I would, you know, I would. That's the kind of thing I think we we should share with the American people and have discussions, philosophical discussions about what that means for us, and you know, what that means for our planet and you know how that and, and and particularly whether it's a good thing for us to continue to you know spend so much money fighting each other when maybe we should be trying to make this planet livable mm. and ha habitable and you know do all the other things i think it will be really good for us to know those things and I, I suppose they want to keep it secret so they can you know weaponize those technologies or whatever they're i guess they you know they probably think they have good reasons for doing it but i think there's compelling reasons if they have that stuff that we should release it to people are you a sci-fi guy at all mr kennedy am i what are you a sci-fi guy do you have a kind of a broader interest in in entertainment that's related to this kind of stuff i would say that i always like science fiction mm -hmm. and i mean i you know, I'm curious about aliens. I've never seen an alien. I have. Can we get it confirmed that RFK Jr. is a is a Trekkie, <laughs> is a Star Wars fan? Rihanna like loves that. loves Star Trek. I like no, Star I'm Wars, tell you Star Galactica. My, my wife my wife had a show uh, called Son of Zorn, which was a where she was married to this alien, and so she went to the Comic Con conferences where you know there uh, all the Trekkies are, and and she was a sh for a short time a big hero in those conferences, and I a couple of times said I want to go with you and you know and see all these things. So I'm not, I'm not completely immune to it, but I I'm still the jury's out. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, we hope to have you back here on Rising, perhaps in a debate format. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.